read verse 14. If we love our Christian brothers and sisters, it proves that we have passed from death to life. But a person who has no love is still dead. Mm. Let's examine that for a moment. Let's see. Look at the statement. Love is the founding principle of the gospel and is an indication of true salvation and deliverance from sin and death. Scripture says if we love our Christian brothers and sisters, it proves that we have passed from death to life. How do we know that we have passed from death to life? And we love each other. It's not the scriptures that I can quote, or the money that I give, or even the good that I do. I am still dead if I don't love. If I, if I can't love my brothers and my sisters according to this scripture, I am still dead. I have not passed from death into life. Now, now I've been to seminary and I've been in church a lot, and there's a whole lot of things we said makes you say, this is how you know that you are alive in God because you walk in the newness of life. But I don't remember anybody telling me that if you don't love your brothers and your sisters, you are still dead. I had all these other things they told me to do in order to be saved, but nobody said, oh yeah, by the way, this is how you know that you have passed from life to death, that you love your brothers and your sisters. First John 3.16, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we are also to give up our lives for our brothers and our sisters. What y'all think about that statement there? Anybody have an issue with that? It's not easy. Because what is he, he what is he asking us to do here? To you know, put yourself in second place, essentially. Put yourself in second place, right? He, he's saying, be like Jesus. Now that's nice in a song. I want to go oh, to be like Jesus. That's real cute in a song to sing on Sunday morning. But Jesus died for somebody who was guilty. And he is saying, so you are also to give your life for your brothers and sisters. I don't know anybody that I'm willing to die for to you. <laughs> I love my wife, but, you know, I'll, I'll have to do it if I have to. But I wouldn't willingly choose. I'll try to find another option. Can we work something out? Hmm? Way in this game. Way in this game. I think if there's a way out, Lord, I need it right now. <laughs> huh? but, but the scripture here says that we, and we start off saying, follow the example of Christ. Well, he gave his life. The most precious thing you have is your life. And he is saying, give your life for your brothers and your sisters. Real love has no limits. Love does not ask how much, how long, how far? Love just asks how. Love doesn't care how long it takes. Love doesn't care how much it costs. Love does not care how far we have to go. Love just asks how can I help? What can I do? So we must be prepared to pay the price of love. It is costly to love with the love of Christ but it is a terrific investment of heavenly rewards. Think about the joy that we experience in our life and how that is directly tied to the investment of love that Jesus made. And we may never be asked to give up our life for somebody else. But yet at the same time, on a daily basis, we are asked to give up our life. Give up your time. 
Sometimes people just want some time with you, to talk to you, to be a listening ear to them. But you're so busy in your own stuff, your own life that you got going on, you don't have time to give up your life for them. They just want 20 minutes of your time. There are times that we have to hang in there with people longer than what we anticipated. We started off, and you say we're there for the long haul, but then you say, how much you say? <laughs> how long is that going to take? How far we got to go before we come back? Hmm. All these opportunities that we have to demonstrate the love of Christ. And, and sometimes it's that the simple act of listening to somebody that demonstrates the love of Christ in a way that they have not experienced it before. That statement here. It may cost you money, respect, dignity, pain, heartache, ridicule, ridicule, perhaps even your life. Sacrifice it for the name of Jesus. He will accept it and reward you. Yeah. The point here is that we do this in the name of Jesus for the gospel's sake. The reality is that Paul referred to himself as this on several occasions. He referred to himself as a slave or a bond servant of the gospel, which means he, he lives for the will of the gospel, that everything that he did was directed for the sake of the gospel. Are you ready? Are you willing to give up your dignity? Are you ready to have heartaches and ridicule for the sake of the gospel? Sometimes you are called to love that person that society rejects. And now your name is bad because you're hanging out with somebody that society rejects. Folks ask Jesus, why are you hanging out with those tax collectors? You know they rob me, they steal, you're the son of God, and you're hanging out with the tax collector. What's up with that? But love caused him to do that, to his own peril. And sometimes we are required to do the same. All right, now, then we have to stand firm in love. In the few minutes we have remaining, let's look at this. Don't waver in love. Sometimes we start off with a commitment to love all the way through, but then we change our mind. We start off, somebody's dealing with something, and you say, I got you all the way. We, we're going all the way home with this. I don't care what happens. I don't care what people say about you. I don't care. I'm going to love you all the way through it, but then it costs too much, and we change our mind. Abraham was called a friend of God because he refused to waver in unbelief. See that in Romans 4 20. Love and faith are sides of the same coin. To waver in faith is to waver in love. Let's walk through this for a minute. Simply resolve to stay on course, and when the going gets tough, keep loving. Don't doubt or waver. God will justify your faith and love. Galatians 5, verse 6 says, For when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, there is no benefit in being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. This is so interesting because the scripture here ties faith and love together. So you say, well, I have great faith, but I got a love problem. Well, you don't have great faith because faith expresses itself in love. If I can love you to the point where I'm willing to give up my life for your life, that means that I have enough faith to believe that whatever I give up, God's going to take care of me. See, sometimes it's hard to love people all the way because we're still trying to take care of ourselves. i got to protect me and mine. I don't really believe all the way 
that God's going to take care of me and mine. And so I'll go so far, but if it starts costing me too much, then i got to pull back. But faith says, I have been called to express love, and I'm going to express it all the way. And I have enough faith to believe that no matter what I give out for the sake of love, God will replenish it, he will repay me, and he will reward me for this expression of love. Because if I look to you, if I look to man to pay me, I run the risk of being disappointed. And so if I don't think you're really going to appreciate my love and reward me for my love, then I may hold it back from you. But if I don't expect anything from you, that's the, the last scripture we're going to talk about, is giving love, not expecting something in return from the person that you give it to. Now, we like to love you scratch my back and I'll scratch you. You do for me and I'll do for you. But love does not require anything in return. <coughs> Matter of fact, love gives when you're in the middle of offense. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners and enemies of God, Christ died for us. Christ didn't wait until we show him love and then say, okay, you, you have earned my love. I will now die for you. When we were against him, he loved us and died for us. And so faith and love work together. As you are exercising love, you are exercising faith because you're having faith in the word of God. You have faith in what God has said about love. And you say, God, you command it, you require it, I believe it, and I'm going to give it. For God so loved the world that he gave, and we do likewise. All right, let's look at Luke. Chapter 6, verse 27 through 36. We'll probably close out on these verses here. Luke 6, verse 27 says, But to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. Mm. So we have individuals here that are enemies. They hate you. They curse you. And they hurt you. Now, but he says, love them. Do good to them. Bless them. Pray for them. Hmm. Let's be honest. That is an unnatural response to somebody who is your enemy, who hates you, who curses you, and hurts you. It is not natural to love that person, do good to them, and even as spiritual as we are, to pray for them. And I definitely don't want to bless somebody who's cursing me. That is just not natural to do that. But that's supernatural. That's the power of the Holy Spirit to say, I'm going to love somebody. We're not, now, an enemy is not just somebody who has an all against you. An enemy is somebody who has a plan to destroy you. That's an enemy. Sometimes we think somebody's an enemy, and they're really not. They just don't like you for whatever reason. But an enemy stays up at night planning how they're going to destroy you. And Jesus says, love them. Somebody that hates you, do good to them. Bless them and pray for them. That is a supernatural requirement that God has placed on us as believers. That this is how, what, what am I supposed to do when I am confronted with an individual like this? I'm supposed to love them, do good, bless them, and pray for them. Now don't raise your hand, but how many of us do that? I'm going to drink some water while you think about it. <laughs> Many of us, we don't start off that way. We have to be convinced. Okay, Lord, I won't talk about them. I'm going to pray for them. Here now is faith and love working together. Because it takes a whole lot of faith for me to do good to somebody who I know hate me. Okay, it's not just me. I'm going to look on this side. All right. 
And to bless somebody that curses you means that I, while you are wishing me harm, I am praying God's blessing upon you. And I'm saying, God, ignore the fact that they are cursing me. I want you to bless them. Not, not, not like David prayed on one occasion, God cut them off and their children and their great-grandchildren. No, God, I want you to do that. Now that I can do. But this requires faith. It requires more faith to do this than any other thing. Some of the things that really get us stuck and inhibited in our relationship with God is we run into these people and we don't know how to handle it. And, and we're good, we are sacrifice giving our life for the stranger on the street, but that one person in church that hurt us, even we went across this scripture, we're like, Lord, I don't know, I don't know if I can do that. Verse number 29, if, the, if verse 27 and 28 bother you, well, wait till you see verse 29. He said, if someone slaps you on your cheek, offer them the other cheek also. What do we think that means? What does that mean? Someone slap you on the cheek, offer them the other. Don't retaliate. Don't retaliate. Very good. Don't retaliate. That's really what that, that means. We don't respond in like fashion. If someone does something against you, you are not to respond. Now what about this offer the other cheeky part? What do you think about that? Like give them a clean slate. Give them a clean slate. See, then we say, I, I'll forgive you, but she ain't come by my house no more. I forgive you, I won't retaliate, but this relationship right here is over. You will never be close enough to me to slap. You gotta be close enough to somebody to slap them. I can't slap somebody if they're up there. They gotta be close to me in order for me to slap them. Hmm? So this part here says, not only do I not retaliate, but I don't put a distance between you and me. Now, now that's a hard thing until you think about what you expect from Jesus when you slap him, metaphorically, I dare you to try it. <laughs> but we offend him all the time, but he, he allows us to remain close enough to him that we can offend him again. I got two minutes, so let me run through here. He says, uh, if anyone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks. And when things are taken away from you, don't try to give them back. Do to others as you would have them do unto you. Here's where we'll, we'll stop with verse 32 and 36. He says, if you love one of those who love you, why should we get credit for that? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. If you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. For he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate, just as your Father is compassionate. He lays out a couple of things here. I'll, I'll make this comments. He says, you don't get credit for doing good to those who are good to you. Because even sinners do that. You don't get credit when you loan money to people who can afford to pay you back. Because sinners do that. You don't get credit for loving people who love you. Even sinners do that. 
he says, in this, this part here, he says, love your enemies and do good. Love them and do good for them. And then lend to them without expecting to be repaid. And so if your enemy comes to you, oh man, Jesus, Jesus teaches some hard stuff. He says, if your enemy comes to you and says, listen, I, I'm having a rough time. I know I've been dogging you out in the street and everything, but I'm having a rough time right now. Can you uh, help me out? Jesus says, well, lend to them without expecting anything in return. He says, then your reward from heaven will be great. Notice what he says, and this is the key point. Here. He says, if you do this, then you are acting like children of God. If you do this, then you are imitating God when you do that. You are most like God when you are doing good to those who are doing evil to you. That is when you are most like God. Why? Because God does that all day, every day. He does good to those who are not good to him. Amen, somebody. Right? Then, last point. For real, this is my last point. Uh, it says, for he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. He is kind to those who are unthankful. Means that he does for them and they don't appreciate it. And he says they are wicked which means they are against him. Who wants to do anything for somebody who is unthankful and wicked? But isn't that how God got you? You were unthankful and wicked. I know it was many years ago, but you were still <laughs> unthankful and wicked. <clears throat> and that's how God got you. And you know what? That's how he's going to win your enemy to him. And he's going to use you to do that. Because guess what? When he died on the cross for you, guess what? He died on the cross for your enemy also. That same person who is the thorn in your flesh, God loves them in the same way that he loves you. And he says, if you want to be my children, then you must love in the same way. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we do thank you for your goodness and your mercy tonight. We thank you for your love that we have experienced. For it has no limit. It has no measure. Lord, your love is unlike any love that we have ever known before. But without your love, we could be nothing, we could do nothing, and we could have nothing. Lord, your word requires us to live in a way that goes beyond our own expectations and our own abilities. But we thank you tonight that through the power of your spirit, you have made us more than able to live out this gospel so that men and women will see your goodness and be saved as a result of that. God, as we examine ourselves tonight, I pray that you would open up the eyes of our understanding that we may know what your will is and what your purpose is and what your plan is. Your word says that we should pray for them, pray for our enemies, those who hurt us and bless them and love them and do good to them. So I pray, oh God, that not only will we be hearers of your word, but we will be doers also. We thank you and praise you for all things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you for your, your time tonight. Any announcements? I think uh, we do have a meeting tomorrow at 6.